That's what you can do. That's your mission. Uh, you can change the world. These pastors, five hours before Sandy, did not have a need. Their churches were all taken care of. In fact, they were all beautiful. But within five hours, their lives were drastically changed. And we're not talking about five or six pastors or seven pastors. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of people. And the saddest thing I know is we have to beg to get churches to send workers to people who have lost everything. Why is that? Have we lost all compassion? You know, I never have to beg. You know, most of those men today, every time there is a disaster, I get a check for four to five thousand dollars from them. You know why? Because they were the recipient of that kind of love. Maybe it's because we never suffer in this country. We hide suffering from ourselves. We don't even see dead bodies anymore. They're put in a building, a special beautiful car. They're housed in beautiful caskets. We don't even open the top of the casket. We're afraid for children to experience death today. We're horrified at it. And so we go through life in a cleansed world that knows nothing about suffering, the greatest suffering we have is we've got a test next week. And most of the time we think the teacher is a little unfair about that. And we're swift to tell them so. Why? Because we do not endure hardship. It's not a part of our vocabulary. And yet every day in this world, people experience the kind of horror that you couldn't put on a TV screen and explain it in full detail. I want you to recognize you didn't come here for us to entertain you. You came here so God would break your heart and you would see that you have so much value to the rest of the world. And they desperately need what God has invested in you. God invested in you great talent. God gave you all that you have. And now it is up to you to take everything that you are, everything that you hope to be, everything that you shall be. You're a piggy bank. And God keeps putting things in His piggy bank. And someday he will come to you in, as his piggy bank. And he will turn you upside down and he'll start shaking. And he will pull from you everything you need. But you can only know that great joy if you are willing to be the piggy bank. Amen. Will you invest today with me? That's the issue, young people. Are you brave enough do you have the courage and do you have the sense of sacrifice that you would allow God to take your life and move it in any fashion He chooses so that the world can see the hand of God? Nehemiah said they saw the great hand of our God, the good hand of our God. God's hands are good. We need to show it. All right? Well, that's my hobby horse. All right? But it's a good hobby horse. All right? Uh, I hope everything has uh, been good today. Uh, Jim Childress is going to speak for us, and then we're going to have uh, Brother Savinsky. Uh, Jim is from Panama. He's worked with me so many years that uh, it's not even funny and does a great job. And we love him to death, okay? And his wife Phyllis is here. She gets very little billing, but Jim wouldn't be what he is if it weren't for Phyllis. That's true. Yes. So, and very Phyllis true. sometimes goes, oh, don't say that. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I want to invite your attention to just a couple of verses.
to just reinforce, I don't know why Brother Milton stayed and preached half of my message, but I guess it's because my wife looked at me and said, you know you only have 20 minutes. So, in John chapter 4, verse 35, very common verses of scripture we've heard preached from for many times. Say ye not, and say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto, the li unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is, is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. What I want to focus on for the next few minutes is this. We have a partnership ministry. We have partnership evangelism. And I don't know how many times it's been said as missionaries are preaching in churches, we cannot do our calling without you talking to the church membership. We are local church sent. We are local church based because that's Bible based. Amen. And in that process, we become partners between church and missionaries. So the church cannot fulfill the Great Commission without the missionaries, and the missionaries cannot fulfill the Great Commission without churches. And that seems to be a practical understanding for us. What I want to focus here is that the fields are white already into harvest. I have been in churches, and I've had this in my own church at times, where we have an intermittent light going on and off. Every second the light comes on, and then it goes off. And there is a sign down below, every time the light flashes, a soul goes into eternity. And then you can calculate by the end of a church service, if you've been there for an hour, how many thousands or hundreds of thousands of people have gone out into eternity while we have been in church. And our gospel goes around the world and some churches have had the, the phrase, the sun never sets on our ministry, and that's a good phrase, and that's a good thought, that our church would take us around the world. When I became pastor of my last church, our church was focused by the previous pastor on supporting pastors in Panama and not so much missionaries around the world. And about the first thing I did was to regain focus and balance of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 and take the, Pan uh, the gospel out of Panama and send it around the world. And today, every little bit we would, would change from supporting permanent pastors to supporting a church in a a missionary in a different country because we wanted to be world focused Amen. brother Milton has been a man of great inspiration of vision to me there was a time when we did our very first medical clinic in Panama and we built it as a test to see if we would make that ministry work. Do you remember that conversation? Oh, yes, sir. And after that first medical clinic, we decided, yes, it can be done. And Brother Milton just kept coming up with these ideas and these plans and these uh, uh, concepts for making sure the gospel goes around the world in whatever means possible. Through his efforts to do medical clinics and donations uh, to the health ministry of Panama, I got a phone call one day from the First Lady of Panama. She said, we need your help. I like having the First Lady of Panama call me and say, help me. <laughs> and I called Brother Milton and explained that situation, and he said, let me see what I can do about it. 
in the long term, we were able to attend to the need of the First Lady. And a great big, large donation that was sitting in Tampa, Florida, was moved to North Carolina and then sent to Panama by military aircraft. And all the Ministry of Health had to do was come pick it up. That's all they had to do. And later on, the secretary for the First Lady, the executive secretary, would tell me, you are the first group that ever fulfilled your promise. What a testimony for Brother Milton. Amen. So we have been inspired by him and all the things that he's done. And we knew the day would come when he would resign as pastor and get full time into this ministry and how God has blessed it and it has bloomed. And I praise the Lord for that. In John chapter 9 and verse uh, uh, 35. No, where do I want to be? No, I, Matthew 9? No, I, yes, Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. That verse and another one similar in Luke are the verses that our chapter of ORH in Panama uses. Because the vision of Brother Milton was captured by some of our medical staff in Panama. And we have a chapter. And at one of different times when Brother Milton need a staff member to fill a hole, somebody from our team went to Cambodia or to Peru or to Uganda, and I think that's been two or three times. And our whole team has gone to Mexico and Honduras and Indonesia as we also captured that vision. The idea that we could take the gospel knowing that there was a need to share that gospel and send the message around the world. And as we did that, we noticed that the Lord was doing something special. And then we know in verse 36, it was referenced in our services already, that uh, Jesus was moved by compassion, and that is an example for us to follow as well. And then in verse 37 is where Jesus took the opportunity to use an experience that had just happened to further teach his disciples. And he said to them there, Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And we have realized that for a long time. And that cry has come out, we need more laborers. And there is no apology for that cry. Amen. We have gotten focused on materialism and we have let it dominate it, our lives. Even as spiritual Christians that go to church at least three times a week, we still have problems with 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, 16, and 17, of how the world has its influence over us. Love can often be defined by sacrifice. And what our proposal, what Brother Milton's proposal, and what other members that have been participating in ORH for years will gladly resound the same message, we need more laborers. And not only laborers, my people in the different clinics where we have gone, the, 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 the people of the community have been astounded when I tell them these people did not come here as hired people. They came here as Christian volunteers who paid their own way and paid extra to buy your medicine that you're going to get at the end of this clinic. And they were just astounded. Thinking that medical people would sacrifice, pay their own way to have a chance to serve God. We're looking more for more of you, we want more of you, we need more of you, 
And we can expand when you decide what many others have already decided. This is a good way to invest your life in good works that God expects us to do. It's amazing that in Panama, we cannot get nonprofit status for our church just because we're a church. You can do that in the States. For us to be qualified for nonprofit status, we have to be involved in good works that happen outside of our own church community. Interesting? The world sees our responsibility better than we often see it set right smack dab middle of the congregation. I have a quote, a message, a note in my book, and I'm not promoting my book here, I'm just getting a chance to use something in it. Because when I wrote the book, and other people told me I needed to write it, and I did, I decided I didn't want to leave any empty spaces like the end of a chapter, so I put in missions quotes or Bible quotes. And here is a small work that was found stuck on a pastor's wall in Africa many years ago. The title is, My Commitment as a Christian. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of His. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. Lean on his presence, walk by patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow. My way rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and walk uh, until he stops me, work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no Problems recognizing me, my banner will be clear. Written by a young African pastor, tacked on the wall of his home. And as I read that and looked at it, I said, I wish I had written that many years ago. We are partners in evangelism with the concept, the goal, the desire of preaching the gospel to every person, and not only that, seeing as many as possible come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
And in that process, we need to work. A closing thought. I hate dandelions. <laughs> and they're all over this campus. When I'm at my dad's, I'm spreading that kind of stuff that kills big leaf flings and because I like the yellow flower. But I don't like that little ball that comes up there with all those seeds on it and goes everywhere and produces more dandelions. <laughs> As I was taking care of my dad's lawn one day, I came up with this thought. Why aren't we producing like the dandelions? We are partners in the Great Commission. Accept partnership with us. Amen. Amen. Amen and see that we have a greater reward by winning more and more people to Christ. God bless you. Amen. I don't think I've heard it said better, do you? That's exactly what we've got to do, folks. This is the time. Um, Jim is not going to tell you about his life. But could I say one thing that ought to be said? You know, we sit here today thinking about sacrifice. Jim hasn't thought about it. He's done it. Right. I've been with Jim when he could not walk because he was on the ocean taking medical equipment and supplies for a major clinic so far up into the jungle that he would be gone days and we would never hear from him. Days. So far up that you could not have a phone, there was no communication, and yet there were people up there and Jim was going to find them and he was going to tell them about Jesus. A wave came over the reef, capsized his boat, Jim's by himself. He's underneath that boat. Every bit of the supplies has gone to the bottom of the ocean. He begins to swim toward the shore with his boat. And if I'm not telling this right, you tell me. I sat on the hull of the boat. Okay, he sat on the hull of the boat. He cheated. Okay. <laughs> there were other swimming adventures. Yes, there were other swimming adventures. Coming down the coastline was a group of kids from a jungle village headed to play soccer, right? They just finished soccer or heading home. They were just finished and they were headed home. Here he is in the middle of no place, and I, I can't tell you, we were on one time, and the, the waves were so big. Oh, I looked at him and I said, Jim, we're not going to make it. I had already prayed and given my family to the Lord. I mean, I'm not joking. Uh, we were looking into waves, and Jim would just keep turning the boat into the waves, and they just got taller and taller. And the storm and the wind, it was terrible. And I looked at him and I said, Jim, we're not going to make it. And he looked at me, and I will never forget these words in all of my life, because only Jim could have said these words. Well, it's a little late to think of that. <laughs> God's always taking care of this man. Along came this group, pulled him into shore, okay? Got him out. He finally got back in. They went out to get his boat, and the captain of the boat that took him out ran over him with the engine, the outboard engine of his boat, and cut and slashed his, le his foot. So bad that after a while, if you don't get stitching immediately, you have to let the wound heal. Do you understand what I'm saying? For six months, he had to let that wound heal. His wife took care of him. Kind of. Kind of. more. <laughs> when he stood right there, my heart broke. 
because I knew the words were backed up by a life that could not be matched in any possible way other than the ultimate sacrifice. And Jim has always been willing, and everybody that knows him will testify that. First time I went to Panama, people said to me, oh, you need to go see Jim Childress. Why? Because they knew that Jim had the heart. And young people, you follow this man with his heart, and God will use you. All right? What he read, he lived long before he ever found it written on a piece of paper. I thank God for missionaries like that. They get out of their office. They go a little ways outside of their home. And they find people who need Jesus. And whatever the need is, they meet. There is no need so great that they could not, with all their heart, in Embrace that need, and with God's help, satisfy it. That's what I want from you. That's what I need from you. That's what you must give. All of us sitting here. And God's people said? Amen. Amen. That's when you're living it, folks. You're right on the edge of it. You're watching it happen, and God does it all, and you just sit there, and you go, whoa. That's wonderful. Brother Savinsky, two great messages. We're looking forward to this message. Brother, thank you so much for being with us. I, when He changed meetings to be here, and I appreciate it so much with all my heart. Thank you, brother. You, oh, love you, my brother. Couldn't do without you. Well, y'all stand, please, at this time. I appreciate Brother Jim. I wish you. I, mean, I was over there. I know what he said uh, the area. And I tell you, it's a wonderful work to see what God's done with this man. And the ministry of, uh, of this whole thing is just powerful for the years. Those who, who, uh, who are nurses, and I thank God for the nurses, and also for the doctors, and just the, uh, how God put this whole thing together. I'm glad I have a small part in it. Maybe see. Would you take your Bibles now and go to 1 Kings chapter 17? As you turn to 1 Kings 17, I want to bring a message about a man of God named Elijah. You know, the Word of God tells you. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition. And so often we look at the life of these men of God and wonder how, how God used their lives in a marvelous way. And, and uh, it's a, a powerful uh, example and encouragement to our lives. So I want us to look at the life of this man, Elijah. Look at 1 Kings 17, 1, please. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was on the heavens of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, for whom I stand, there shall be due no rain these years, but according to my word. Look here, please. Elijah came on the scene at probably one of the worst times in the history of Israel. The new king was one of the worst who ever ruled over the land. 1 Kings 16.30 says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Now this wicked man had two goals in mind. One, he wanted to stamp out the faith of God's people. Number two, he wanted them to worship the false god Baal. At that crucial hour, God raised up the great prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah's name means, my God is Jehovah. This man's very presence was to display the power of God. And that was important because the people had lost sight of the Lord. In Acts 17, 23, the word of God says, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye eagerly worship, him declare I unto you. And Elijah was going to declare this unknown God to Ahab and Jezebel. A husband and wife that were the most diabolical team in the Old Testament. Ahab had no fear of God. 
His unbelief knew no boundaries. But the vastness of that man's ungodliness was no comparison to the greatness of Elijah's faith. For Elijah said in verse 1, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. Look at me. Whenever a man stands with God, he can withstand all the powers of this earth. Amen. Romans 8, 31 says, If God be forced, who can be against us? Exodus 14, 14. The Lord shall fight for you. Deuteronomy 33, 27. They come with God as our refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Amen. Romans 8, 37. For we are more than conquerors through him. Psalm 118, verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. And you know, Elijah had no fear. He stood before that king. He gave the message. And then he left. And when he left, we find God led that man to several locations, which are very significant. You know why? Because I believe as you go through your life as a child of God, God will put all of you, you hear me? All of us, at these specific locations. And what were they? Well, first of all, look at verse 2 and 3. And the word of the Lord came on them, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Now look here, please. It's a Cherith that we see the provision of God for Elijah. You see, after Elijah gave the message, God separated him at Cherith, and then God provided for him in the most unusual fashion. 1 Kings 17.6 says, And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. Now question, young people, why did God use ravens to feed Elijah? Ravens are vultures, an unclean bird. Why did God choose ravens to feed Elijah? The answer is Isaiah 55, 8, where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. You know what God's going to do for you, young man, young lady? He's going to provide for you in his own unique fashion. And did you know, all through life, God will always have a cherub for your life? Psalm 37, 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He'll always take care of you. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so, God had cherished the place of the provision for Elijah. Number two, look at verse nine. The second location. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now look here. Zarephath was a place of the program of God for Elijah. You see, Zarephath means a smelting furnace. It's a place where they take a large metal pot they put broken pieces of metal in there. They then put a real hot heat under it. As that pot gets red hot, all of the small pieces of metal on the inside begin to melt. In the process of melting, all of the impurities in the metal come to the surface. They take a large spoon called a candle, and they will scrape all of the impurities off so the metal will be strong in its final states. Now look at this finger right here, would you please? That's my preaching finger, all right? <laughs> my left hand. You know, if I could point my finger at each one of you in this room tonight, this afternoon, I'd say this to you. Every one of us, there are impurities within our lives. What the Lord will do, He will put us at a chair. He will put the heat under our lives. He will have these impurities service in our lives so God can extract them for one reason. So God can make you a better individual. What was God doing with Elijah at Zarephath? Well, the word of God says he was taken care of by a widow. And the word of God says that one day that widow had a child and the child died. 
And the Bible says of Elijah in 1 Kings 17 and verse 20, And he cried unto the Lord. And 1 Kings 17, 21 says, And he stressed himself upon the child three times. He literally fell on that boy's body. Stressed himself out. He cried out to God. You know what? Have you ever come to a place in your life where you have literally fallen flat on your face and said, Dear God, I don't know what to do. Amen. Now, I'm never impressed any one of you. But I'm embarrassed it too. There been times in my life when I have fallen on my face and I have cried to God and I said, Dear God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You know, young person, Zarephath is a very hot place. But it's a necessary place. Look at me, don't you dare. You hear me? Don't you dare leave Zarephath. There's no way God can shape your life. You see, God will not destroy you at Zarephath. God will develop you. Psalm 66, verse 12. We went through fire and through water, but thou brought us out into a wealthy place. Job 23, 10. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So, He'll have you at Zarephath. There's a program that God must have you go through to shape your life and extract those things that would destroy you. But third of all, when you go to chapter 18 and verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hop ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Now look this way, look this way. The third location was Mount Carmel. It's at Mount Carmel we see the place of the pro, the power of God for Elijah. You know, on Mount Carmel, Elijah faced 450 false prophets of Baal. And Elijah gave a challenge. He said, you build an altar, you put a bullock on it, you put no fire under, I will build an altar, I'll put a bullock on and no fire under. And the God who answers by fire, let him be God. And they took the challenge. And those 450 prophets of Baal, they took and built the altar. They put the bullock on and no fire. And they began to pray. And they said, oh Baal, hear us. And there's no answer. And therefore, they began to cut themselves where blood was running out of their body. They said, Oh, Bell, see our sincerity? Hear us. And for six hours they prayed. And now they're exhausted and weak, and they sat down. Elijah comes on the scene. He built the altar, he put the bullock on, and then he said, Pour four barrels of water on the altar. And I could just see those prophets of Baal, their eyeballs are getting this big. And when they poured the four barrels of water on, he said, pour four more barrels of water on the altar. And by this time, their mouth is no doubt gaping wide. And then he said, pour four more barrels of water on there. And then Elijah prayed 63 words. And when the last word came out of his mouth, Fire fell out of heaven, consumed everything, and the people cried and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. You know what they saw? They saw the power of God. Amen. You know what I long in my ministry? I long to see the power of God in my life. Amen. Have I been to Mount Carmel? I have been on Mount Carmel. But I can't tell you about it. It's too sacred to me. I thank God He gave me the honor of going and seeing Him do unusual things that there's no explanation He was of God. Young person, your cry ought to be, Lord, I'd love to go one day and see your power manifested in my life. For I keep my hands off. It's all of you, God. 
I'll make it difficult. I'm not going to make it easy. I'll make it difficult, Father, for you to show your genuine power. Look, he's the God of all power. Yes. He can do anything. But you know something? You don't stay on Mount Carmel very long. You know why? The air is too thin up there. So oh, you may go and experience Mount Carmel, and you will if you, if you allow God to shift your life. But then he'll put you perhaps back at Sheriff or Zarephath, and again let you go on Mount Carmel. A young person, I'll tell you what, he has and will provide every need for your life. He does have a program for you. And one day he'll allow you to experience his power and let you see his mighty power manifested in your life. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. <coughs> Before I do pray, will the heads bow? You say, Brother Jerry, you know, I need to be a chair in my life. I need to see God provide for me. Or perhaps you say, you know, you may not know, but I'm going through, but I'm going through a zero fact. I tell you, it's very hot, hot in my life right now. And it's very difficult. I've never understood why God loved us. And, but the day I see God is refining my life, isn't it? Yes, he is. Perhaps you long, you crave to be and experience the power of God upon your life. You say, Brother Jerry, there are specific needs in my life. Would you just pray for God to help me respond to him accordingly? Would you raise your hand and voice that to your Lord? All right, God bless you. All right, God bless you. As soon as you raise your hands, God bless you. Let's put them back down. Okay, God bless you back there. Others, yes, God bless you. Our dear Father, we thank you for the example of this great man of God, Elijah. And Lord, I pray today for those in this room. The great potential here, Father, to be used of you. Yes. That no, Lord, you'll always provide for us. You always have, Lord. And I praise you, Father, for the fact that your program is always perfect. Yes. And I thank you, God, the day that you can manifest your power. Where people stand in awe. And you get all the glory. You get all the praise. And we uplift and exalt the Savior. Thank you for the blessed Holy Spirit, Father, who guides us in all truth. And may this message be a, a means of edification for your people, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Boy, it's great, isn't it? Amen. It's wonderful. Uh, we have a song that we always sing. I think we're ready to sing it now. Okay? Uh, I think we're beginning to see where we got to go, okay? Uh, and we love this song in ORH. We sing it all the time. Uh, and it's the prayer of David Livingston. Lord, send me anywhere. How many of you know that? Oh, good, okay. Let's sing the chorus, and we'll do the verses tomorrow, and we'll just enjoy everything, okay? Lord, send me anywhere. Can you write that now across your heart? Can you say, Lord, don't pass me by. No. Send me anywhere. I'll go. Lay any burden on me. Just be with me, Lord. I give my life to you, Lord. It's yours. You do with me as you see fit. 
young people, when you say those words, you will have just engaged on the greatest life that you could ever hope to experience on the face of this earth. Because God Himself will go with you and take you to places you never thought you could go. And you will do things you never thought you could do. And at the close of your life, you will long to see His face because He is so close to you. And people will watch and they will not understand. But you will. You will understand the dearest things about the God that you've talked about. But now, you know. May God send each one of us to His field to accomplish those great things. Amen? Amen. Father, bless us now. We have so much to do for You. We're listening, Lord. May we hear Your voice. May we see Your power. And may we enjoy Your presence. In Jesus' precious name, Amen.